check, check. Can you hear me? Hey, Rob. Yep. Go on mute. Hi guys. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, not bad, not bad. So, so where are you guys? What's your what's your time zone? We're uh, Eastern Standard Time, U.S. So I think we are six, seven hours behind you. Seven hours? What time is it right now? It's uh, well, it's uh, nearly four thirty here. Uh, so yeah, it's it's almost nine thirty here. Yeah. So, so you guys are still very much drinking coffee at this point in time. Indeed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm working up to beer, but I'm, I'm on tea in the middle at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a transition. Exactly. So I was just over in the um, stage one uh, where Alan, Alan Glickenhaus, is still uh, talking about ecosystems, etc. It's, uh, it's a good presentation, actually, uh, but uh, had to come across to this one. So um, well, let, let's give it another couple of minutes, uh, get some more people in. So we've got Robert, Tony, and we're also waiting for Nate, if I'm correct. Yep. Correct. Yep. All right. Good stuff. All righty. Well, yeah, let's give it a couple of minutes, and then we can uh, kick things off. Awesome. So, Alan, I'm on your website and uh, checking to see that you uh, don't list us uh, along with your API management systems that you guys work with. Uh, if you're interested in changing that, we could talk sometime. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'll do it in the background while we're talking. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Perfect. That's nice. For sure, for sure. That's coming on immediately afterwards. All right. All right. Uh, Let's see. Okay. Have hey, we got Nate as well on board now? Hi, Nate. Good morning. Yeah. Hey, good morning. Can you guys hear me? Good morning. Yes. Yes. We can All hear right. and see you, and uh, we can see that you're you're caffeinated already by the looks of things. I am. Cheers. Cheers. Even a further hour behind us. So. Uh, oh wow. Yeah. He's the winner today. Hey, Alan, <laughs> I threw my, uh, my email address in the chat if you want to grab it. Yeah, we can follow up and have more of that kind of discussion in the future. Cool. Great. So um, I guess Alan is probably doing some Q&A right now. So, But um, it's 26 minutes past, so I guess we can uh, kick things off. So uh, of course, we're here today to talk about the um, service mesh. So adding service mesh to your enterprise API governance program. So um, before we begin with the topic, let's do a short round of uh, introductions. So um, well, I'll, I'll kick off first. So I'm Alan Canaba. I'm from um, a company called Apiable. We started this year uh, with an API products and uh, portals. So um, 
Tony, why don't you go next? Sure. I'm the uh, director for API management, application integration, and high speed for here at IBM. So, as part of the uh, offering management team, we set the direction for how we invest in these products. Uh, and uh, the others on the call with me are part of my team. I'll, I'll pass baton over to, to Nate. Nate, you want to say hi? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Nate Zeman. Um, I work for Tony. Um, and I look after our API lifecycle management and our gateway portfolio. And I'm Robert Thielen. I work for Nate, and uh, I'm a product manager for API Connect, focused on uh, service mesh. All right, cool. And and as we said, I think Alan just in time. How about that? Hi, Alan. <laughs> just came over from the uh, the stage. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was watching that one. It was good. I, I didn't want to leave, but unfortunately, I had to come over. Um, yeah. Hey, uh, Alan, uh, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself? Sure. I work with this other group of folks here. Uh, so I'm on the uh, API Connect offering management team, uh, as well as the other integration products from IBM. Uh, I'm the digital transformation and API business strategist. Let's leave it at that. We've got lots of other things to cover. <laughs> All right, cool. So um, some of the guys who RSVP'd for the session, they, they uh, gave us some questions in advance. So we can start working through those now. However, if you, um, if you have a question you would like to ask, just go ahead and do so in, in the chat down here. And uh, we'll see if we get around to those. So um, let, let's kick off with uh, one of the easier questions. Um, so uh, what is IBM's point of view around service mesh and API management? Um, specifically, where do they overlap and where do they complement one another? Um, who wants to answer that first? I think maybe I can get us started um, on, on this one. <clears throat> That's the easier question. I'll leave the harder ones to the other guys. Yeah, so uh, you know, I think this is a, an area that's definitely maturing in the industry, right? Uh, I think we're still on the cusp of a lot of uh, uh, adoption of, of service mesh, and, and customers we work with are still trying to grapple with how they fit that in. So I think the, the question is coming up from a lot of the enterprise architects we speak with. A um, you know top level point of view, uh, you know, we think service meshes are are part of the future of a strong API management platform. Uh, the ability to uh, deploy containerized workloads and microservices aligned uh, infrastructure, you know, primarily Kubernetes, but not exclusively. And the adaptability of service meshes to help <clears throat> control and monitor, uh, you know, measure the traffic within that framework is a, is a wonderful addition to the IT infrastructure that uh, many enterprises are going forward with. Uh, you know, as, as they look for the instrumentation of that platform and, and basically the, the ground level security of that platform. Um, it's, uh, you know, depending on which mesh that you're interested in, of course, there's limitations about how much broader than that it can go. And so, you know, the ability to manage other workloads, uh, to also manage complex topologies across multi-cloud, hybrid cloud. You know, we see a lot of where the um, edge gateway and, and, and the hybrid deployment uh, <clears throat> doesn't really align with uh, the methodologies that are being adopted with service mesh. And so, you know, at a high level, I think more directly, they're very complementary. Uh, we think, uh, you know, increasingly uh, the intent will be for vendors like IBM and others uh, in the open source community and through our open source contributions to increase the value of the service mesh to customers who are adopting it. Uh, but the ideas of um, uh, promotion, socialization, monetization, uh, it don't, don't directly view a lot of those additional capabilities as part of the life cycle, will be inherent in service mesh. And so I think the, the two need to be joined up together. Uh, and increasingly, as people are looking towards those more modern forms of uh, development and deployment, uh, they'll increasingly look to service mesh to do that underlying foundational work. And then the ability for discovery, you know, and uh, again, the alignment of those two technologies for the socialization, promotion, full life cycle, product management, uh, subscription management, et cetera, that will remain the domain of the API management space. Yeah. Cool. Good answer. And uh, okay, Robert, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. To to add on to that a little bit, the you know where where service mesh ends and API management begins, I think that there's a pretty clear space between these two areas, and that is at the the, the app level. Um, span control is so important. So so we can talk all day about architecture and about the vision of you know this giant mesh to to rule them all. But at the end of the day. Software is made by people, it's made by teams. APIs are made by individuals. And we have to recognize the fact that 
service mesh is great when, when you have span and control. A team, maybe even an organization can have a service mesh and, and can control access to it and have a vision in there and control all the, all the governance. But the second that you leave that application layer or that, uh, that, um, that, that team or that organization, you need an API layer. You need a contract. Because the people that are utilizing those APIs, they don't have access and don't understand exactly what's going on inside the service mesh at all times. And yes, there's tools coming out to give them a little bit more access. But at the end of the day, for a true API strategy, you have to go outside of the service mesh. Most organizations, even Google, you know, only has about 60% of their workloads running on uh, on Istio or service mesh right now. And, you know, they are, you know, one of the leaders in it. Uh, new organizations can only do so much uh, with, with service mesh. Everyone else still has VMs and traditional workloads. You've got to recognize that people make APIs, make software, and API management helps with that strategy to actually bring it beyond, you know, just a team. So, you know, the... There's a pretty clear line where we need socialization and where service mesh is great. You know, if I can talk to Nate every day and say, "Hey, Nate, don't utilize this uh, this microservice right now because I'm working on it," that's great. But the second that someone is farther away, like you, Alan, if you want to start using my API, I need to have some some level of governance, some level of socialization, some level of of hardcore API uh, gateway to actually ensure that, you know, we have a boundary there and that's where it really becomes critical. And that's really a part of our point of view as well, is that people make software, not architects. <laughs> I'm going to jump, jump in just short. I'm going to be very short. So, cause I know you get, want to get the question too. Uh, I, I think it's important though, to, to recognize where the confusion is. Right. And, and so there's some terminology that sounds alike, right? So, so you, you hear about service meshes doing security, you hear about service meshes doing the, the handling the interaction or in calls between the different microservices. And you think, well, doesn't an API do that, right? And, and, and so just as Rob just described that, you know, there's a point where the service mesh does it within the, the local context, but once you get beyond that, it just doesn't, right? So, so we need to have this other layer that handles the, the longer, Distance interactions and, and the longer and, and the entry security, right? Um, you're not going to put an API between every microservice inside the mesh, right? So, so I, I think that it's important to recognize where the confusion comes from. All right, cool. Um, should we take another question? We, we've got a question from uh, Yuka. He asked, um, "What are the biggest challenges to overcome on deploying a service mesh?" whilst also achieving API-driven testing. Good one. All right. Uh, Nate, maybe you want to have a go at that one? I'll leave this one to Rob. Rob. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a great question. So, so API-driven testing is critical. And, um, and you know, having a, a proper strategy around uh, uh, having API testing as part of your CI, CD pipeline and testing um, you know, new changes to a mesh the second they come up in, in a canary type environment is, is, is really a great opportunity. Uh, you know, the question was, what are the challenges? But I'm gonna say that, there are, that, that all the challenges can be overcome with strategy here. And, and strategy is so important when it comes to API testing and uh, API monitoring. So what I would say is the cool part about service mesh is that there's a lot of changes going on, right? Uh, and, and the team in charge APIs oftentimes doesn't have control over all these crazy changes going on. People are bringing up new microservices or maybe they're adding new, uh, new, new capabilities to APIs. Uh, you know, microservices are coming up, coming down. There's canary testing, AB testing. There's chaos testing going on back there. And your goal is to keep the API always working, right? The, the goal of API strategy is to ensure that you build trust with that consumer. And you never want the API to fail. You never want a 500 or 400. So how do you do that? How do you do that in a smart way and that is by integrating API testing into day one. So, so having a test strategy as part of your CIC to pipeline. So when you bring up a new microservice, no matter where it is in the mesh, and this is critical, even if it's nothing to do with the API or you think it's nothing to do with API, that's the crazy thing about, uh, about service mesh is that when you get into actual graph and you know, that, you know, these things bounce all over each other and you know, something that could be tertiary or you know, four or five steps down the line could have an impact on the end version of the API, you know, or, or it could be a third party SaaS service or someone else using microservices far, far away. They have no control over. So, so how do you control for that? You do it through a integrated test strategy where you understand exactly what you want the API to deliver. 
and maybe even start with that. This is the spec of the API, and this is what, when I give it X, I get Y. And then you bring in a, a new service. You, you do a AB test or a canary test. And, and when you open that up, you know, you, you just open up the, the header for the test at first to make sure that it works. And then you start to open up more traffic. But then you have to monitor it as well. So it's not just testing it when it comes out there, making sure it's still working down the road especially for things that are outside of your control. So, so I would say there is a lot of, um, of, uh, of challenges with it, but if you start on day one with the understanding that I'm gonna test everything that comes into a mesh, I'm gonna test everything in my organization that goes through a CICD pipeline, you can really fix a lot of this stuff. And we've, we've really been working on this story so much this year around API driven test. And it's really become a, a you know, a, we've talked to a lot of customers about it and people are starting to put into a CICD pipeline and it's really critical and I'd say that if you're not looking at API test right now and you have a service mesh, you're going to end up with those 500s and 400s because there's just too much chaos happening behind outside of your control. And that's part of the fun with service mesh, you know, control and chaos. That's, that's, that's what you're trying to go for. I want stuff just to happen. But over on this side, you need to ensure it always works. And that's where API test driven strategy comes into play. All right, thanks. I, I think that's basically, um, you know, the the essence of it, right? It, it that that's what um, Yuka, I think it was, is trying to trying to say. Okay, it, how do you control that chaos with, with the testing there as well? Yeah, hey, Alan. Um, I added a, a link actually as Rob was finishing up. I remembered a, a white paper we recently produced on uh, automating your CI/CD pipeline and some of the additions that uh, test and test automation could be useful for. So that link's been put into the chat. Uh, uh, so IBM.biz, okay. high quality APIs, uh, high is capitalized Q. I'm thinking people, people looking at the recording and uh, APIs, uh, API capital. But the um, I want to just add two items real quick. Um, uh, Gartner, I don't think, has published their full lifecycle API management metric quadrant for 2020 yet. But, uh, you know, because we get to see these things participate in those activities. An additional item that they're adding is API testing as a category, uh, which is interesting. And, um, you know, I think this is going to be uh, everybody is concerned about the quality of their APIs. You know, adding that as a dimension to how we measure the API management technology is really cool. Yeah. And, and that concept of automation of how do I make good testing uh, easier for my teams. And so this way, testing isn't an afterthought. It's kind of part of the process. I think, you know, uh, to the question that was asked, uh, getting that process right, right, and, and switching to agile means of development. Uh, there's actually a partner paper on agile uh, API. But um, th that's a challenge, right? Because that's a, that's a culture process change in the organization. Um, I did put down a second challenge as I was thinking. Um, one is uh, related to the first question. Where does service mesh really stop? And we have started to see some people who are adopting service mesh thinking it, it, it can extend far beyond its potential with respect to uh, capabilities. You know, and again, blurring that line of API management. And I think that's a challenge we've seen play out at a couple of customers, you know, and, there, and there's um, internal conflict like with technology as there is with everybody. But I think getting a crystallized view of uh, where where you believe today the service mesh meets your requirements versus where it will be, you know, and, and really dealing with the reality of the practical, you know, where is it now? And I'll say with uh, 1.5 and Istio, right, in, in that environment, there's been a lot of reset in the community. And uh, you know where where the particular challenge I noted was uh, security. Right? What are your security protocols that your CSO office has approved of? You know how do those map now to what are the capabilities in the mesh that you're looking to adapt or adopt? You know and how do those play out with your API management strategy overall for even your internal exposure, but even more so your external exposure of your APIs. All right? There's a lot in the that space where service mesh today. It just isn't quite there yet, you know, and again, uh, how these two technologies are complementary. And so I, I would say watch out for those challenges as far as uh, practical function supported, you know, versus your your corporate needs, uh, you know, that, that parity. So I, I think we've spoken quite like at a, like a high level about service mesh here. Is it possible to give any like killer use cases for, for service mesh that, that, you know, maybe you've already got in place with some customers? Nate, maybe. So let me take Nate off the hook. He, right. He's a new guy <laughs> to the team, <laughs> having just switched over to our team, and we invited him to be part. So uh, Daryl, don't put Nate on the spot again. <laughs> complimentary to him. Uh, he I, may I, I'm looking for a tip going forward, though. Uh, Rob, if I can ask you maybe to fill in on that one. Uh, I, I can take a shot first. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I've done a, a couple of conversations on this. Uh, I mean. 
the, the, the basic uh, technology one is the multi-cloud scenario, right? So if I have uh, applications on premise and in the cloud or multiple clouds and moving between them, um, the idea of ABIs and, and, uh, a, and a mesh together is, is a very common kind of a scenario. But, but beyond that, I, the one I particularly like um, and, and that I've talked to businesses about is, is A-B testing or innovation kinds of things, right? Where I want to introduce something new uh, and try it out. And historically, what we've done with APIs is I would write some new business logic in a microservice and create an API to expose that and have to get somebody to consume that new API to invoke the new code to, to try it out. Um, that becomes a, a, an effort to get people up to on board to this new API. And, and then if it doesn't work well, to get them to go back to the way they used to do it. And it's not, not as seamless, but if I could do uh, an existing API that's doing a certain kind of thing, but I want to do it in a new way with, with the mesh, I can introduce a redirect for some percentage or some particular select set of customers to try to go to the new thing, see if it's working and, and basically as it works better or, or not, move more and less or less traffic there. And I think that's probably a, a great scenario of APIs and mesh working together. So I'll, I'll stop there and let Rob or someone else add to that. Yeah, um, there's two, two kind of killer use cases that, that come to top of mind, but there's so many more. Well, one is that smart routing, right? Like, like it, if I want to do a canary test or I want to do A-B testing, I don't want to test it with my pain customers, my top tier customers. They, you know, they get stable. I want to, uh, you know, to test it on my beta customers or, you know, my, my internal developers or, you know, have a nice little um, dog fooding session, you know, with a, a separate plan. So starting to introduce API logic and API concepts into the mesh is really critical. You, you know, plans is a simple one or products where, you know, uh, we, we can actually, you know, create smart, smart routing to make sure that the A-B test is only done on, you know, on people that are not paying for that API because I shouldn't be, you know, if someone's paying for an API or a partner, I don't want to test this stuff on them. I want it to happen somewhere else. So, you know, very simple Istio logic and bring it, you know, back into uh, into API management and bring API management concepts into the mesh. And the second one that's very similar is JWT, uh, like adding security, uh, top tier security. So, you know, our, our gateway is awesome at, at, at creating JWT. So, so you know, there, there's kind of a stack, uh, a stack kind of scenario where, you know, we, you can terminate the API request, you know, API key, secrets, um, OAuth, whatever it is. Uh, and, and then you can create a JBT token and just simply introduce logic inside of the, the mesh in a second to validate that JBT token inside of the mesh. So what we've done here is created, you know, a very powerful security mechanism that again, in the past would have taken every single microservice has to be on board or you got to put a little gateway in front of all these. And now we've got Envoy with a simple extension that can do it in seconds. and and it allows you know you to add industrial security and still have an API strategy without them interfering with each other. So you get the best of both worlds without having to uh, you know rewrite the book. And and you know those two things are are, are very powerful uh, kind of you know killer use cases. And there's a lot of cool stuff we're working on as well around discovery and and, and pretty cool stuff around that. And, and you know when a new API comes into mesh, how do we get it out and into the world as fast as possible so other people can start to uh, look at it. So there's so many use cases with Istio and with uh, service mesh and we're just really excited about it. But those are just two where you can take API management and throw it into the mesh <laughs> and uh, and get get real benefits really fast. Cool. Um, but one personal question I've got is because you know when I've looked into this topic as well, um, what makes it kind of brain friendly for me is to think of it being as like service meshes, like your east west integration within the data center, and your API gateway is more north south, right? Is that too simplistic? Am I being too simplistic with that thinking, or, or is that like you know a standard way of thinking about this? So, um, I, I, I like the, the uh, image that Gartner's put out about. That, you know, talking about micro gateways and gateways, enterprise class gateways, you know, as well as service mesh and, and the north, south, east, west f suitability of those technologies in those scenarios. I think we have a good reference for it now. I, I generally subscribe the same way you described. Um, you know, uh, there, there's questions even within that definition. Uh, so I, I think it's a wonderful, useful model. But like, is cross service mesh north, south? 
um, right? If, if you've got two independent service meshes, because that's going to be the practicality of many large enterprises. Um, I also want to go back to uh, Rob's earlier point about the application boundary. <clears throat> I, I could have two applications in the service mesh, but I might define traffic between them as north-south uh, for areas of span of control and governance that I would want to associate to the top of that application. Right. And so if we you know, decompose again the, the description Rob gave before, I might have 10 services, but one of them is an API. And why is it an API? It's because I've said it's an API. Right. The other nine are private. I only want to be able to deal with them within my span. I use service mesh to make sure that they're all protected. But the top of that is, you know, is an API that I'm going to expose to other applications. And they may then choose to say, actually, coming out of that, I want to enforce some of the control and policies that I have you know, in the edge gateway, let's say rather than just inherent in the service mesh for security or whatever other reason. And so um, so I think yes to your question, but I think with exception, right? Because I think there are boundaries. And, and one of the discussions I had with a large North American bank was, uh, you know, given that space of, of the complexity, um, you know, it's whatever you want it to be, you know, in that way, because there's optionality, you know, and what are the controls that you want to enforce? Because those controls will actually assert what is, uh, given span of control, you know, and visibility that you want promoted further outside. So. All right, cool. Looking at the time, we've got uh, we've got a couple of minutes, so let's try and take one of the uh, the questions that uh, were posted. Is what would be the preferred API management stack in public cloud environment? From Michael. Well, we like ours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next question. <laughs> Yeah, um, um, you know, that one also is, uh, are, are most companies that we've seen, they're adopting uh, because of choices for the applications that they're either building. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm in healthcare and I'm working with this particular uh, third party and they've chosen Google as their place. And actually I get efficiencies in my infrastructure as a service cost if I keep all of my traffic in Google. But I know I have some use cases where I have to expose that out. Now, my infrastructure as a service might be IBM or Apogee, like, sorry, Apogee, Google, um, might be uh, Amazon. And so, uh, you know, that may not be my primary choice for my infrastructure as a service, but because of this particular application that's critical to my business, now I have a footprint there. So when you say public, you know, again, our disposition is everybody is adopting multiple public uh, clouds, you know, and then protecting the edge of those in every case is is useful and, and kind of um, taking Alan's point why we like ours is because you can put it in this cloud and that cloud and the other cloud and your data center, you know, and then you have consistency of governance and control across that span. And so, um, so uh, you know, is there a, a, a play for native public cloud API? Uh, you know, for sure there is, uh, you know, um, do we think it's, um, practical for most uh, larger businesses. Again, given the complexities of multi-cloud, it's it's not the, the du jour for what we see. Again, anybody who wants that consistency of governance is, is likely making different choices than just de facto public cloud for this specific public cloud. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously I joked a little in my initial answer, but, but to Tony's point, um, that, that what we provide is a consistent product that is the thing that is running in the IBM public cloud also can run in on premise also can run on Amazon or Google or anywhere else and and, and have gateways on any of those places so to the extent that um, you are using multiple public clouds or public cloud and on premise having one way of doing things and not having to learn different gateways and different API management solutions for each place that you put things makes ours uh, a, a good choice. So. And in addition to public clouds, you know, we continue to see our enterprise customers deploying both multi-cloud architecture as well as hybrid deployments. And that really becoming the new norm, not only with selecting multiple public clouds, but also continuing to look at private clouds and deployment of container platforms, Kubernetes bringing in Istio and integrating that bringing together both cloud native deployments, whether it's on premise through something like OpenShift or uh, upstream Kubernetes um, and bringing that together with more traditional deployments and being able to have a coexistence of your APIs, whether they're deployed cloud native, whether they're deployed through through uh, microservices and Istio um, or whether they're continued to deploy traditionally, having that central management is going to continue to be 
um, key, right, to being able to have central governance, consistency, and security and management of APIs. All righty, guys. Thanks very much. Um, thank you for the questions from the audience as well. We, we didn't get through them all, unfortunately. I think we could have done with another 20 minutes, but um, that's all we have time for now. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of your morning. Yep. Take, Take care. Everyone. Bye. Everyone. Thank Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.